Disasters don't just happen. They're a chain of critical events. Unravel the fateful decisions in those final seconds from disaster. Gilla Close Call Sports, we don't like to talk about bad umpiring, but sometimes disasters happen and we need, need, need to call it out and learn from it. We are in college, bottom of the second. The team that is down by a run is batting. It is a 3-2 count with the runner on first. Payoff pitch coming up. Then we'll probably never see him again. Runner goes. Called strike three. And they are going to, what, is it a batter's interference as well? So they call the runner out. That's worst case scenario. Peterson rung up. And then I believe he is called for interference on the throw. So the inning comes to an end. It very easily could have been two on and one out. A couple of calls don't go in favor of the Griffins. Take another look. So in the spirit of the seconds from disaster theme here, the first thing is NC2A rule 6-3-B. Batter interferes with the catcher's fielding or throwing by stepping out of the batter's box or making any other movement that hinders the catcher's play at home base. It doesn't actually matter if the batter's in the box or not if the umpire deems that, quote, he made any other movement that hindered the catcher's play at home base, which, if this is ball four, the retired batter has stepped, even though in the box, in front of the catcher. And if the plate umpire calls that a strike, the plate umpire can legitimately say that the batter interfered with the catcher. Penalty, if batter strikes out, runner's also out, so it's a double play. So the plate umpire, if you're calling that a strike, you can make that call, in my estimation, that's a legitimate interference call if the pitch is a strike, so I have no problem with that. But, seconds of disaster minded here, the first clue that something is wrong is there is an extended conference. About what? If they're talking solely about whether the interference occurred or not, I can stomach that. But that's not what this conference is about, as we'll find out shortly. Again, I want to point out, offensive coach asking to talk about interference. That's okay. Ball strikes, that's expressly prohibited. You make it you make it easier on the umpires to uphold the call if you're already out on the field warming up. And now it looks like they're gonna bring the runner back to second, which I'm pretty sure if I see correctly, Oberdorf never left second. No, he's he has been there the entire time, Sean. And now Joe Spano's gonna get an explanation from our umpiring crew here this afternoon. So I believe the strikeout will stand. Regardless of the call itself, this is the proper procedure to get the head coach to a conference of the umpire, so they do this correctly. With two outs. And you can go back to the, the call on the strikeout, Roger. That's, quite frankly, probably not a good strike call, but it compounded for the Griffins when they called Peterson for interference. And now it, it seems like that call has been overturned. Well, this is one of those days when you would love to have everyone, <laughs> coaches and game day officials mic'd up to get an explanation of what indeed is happening. Well, Mercy Hurst is This is disastrous already because if you're telling the head coach that only the head coach can speak with you as an umpire, you should then speak only with the head coach and not try to talk to the entire dugout. I get it. Dugout warning needs to be issued, but that should be going through the head coach as well. The manner in which this conference is had so close to the dugout is problematic in that regard. Decide to raise the challenge, and everyone sort of just stands around, and sometimes a runner will just stay on the bag if, if he's called out and he thinks maybe he's safe and they're going to challenge. But this is different because... The Griffins' defense came out onto the field. Okay, so you could, I, I, I sort of could see that because Peterson was sort of walking in front of the catcher. Now, he, you know didn't what? Make, he did I, not make contact. I believe Peterson thought it was ball four, Sean. Well, I, I, I sort of disagree with that, Roger. I think you could see his facial expression. Now, he was not happy with the strike call. So once again, we call the head coach over as an umpire and we say, this is what's going to happen. It's not a discussion. If it's a call reversal, it is a communication to tell the coach what is going to happen. It's not an invitation to argue it. It's final. You're not going to change it. So once you tell the coach, 
you move on. This, we haven't quite moved on yet. A ball to a strike. I, I can understand it, you know, reversing the call on the interference, right? I mean, that's something that you can confirm. Shut with. the music off. Well, Roger, good thing we have everyone mic'd up there. So this game is being played under protest. Somehow, some way, Peterson is now at first base, and and I have never seen anything like this. Well, with, with the, the again the runner at second, Oberdorf, you can okay. So let's confer and see if there was truly an interference on the the batter's part. But I don't know how the umpires can confer and change a strike to a ball. Well, they did, and I believe, and I agree, Sean, there is only one out in the inning. Now. Right, which, by the way, it, it pretty clearly was a ball, but I have, I do not know how umpires can confer and, and change a call like that. That's what ultimately comes down to what the home plate umpire decides as the pitch is caught. So, broadcasters, the reason that you have never seen this before is because it's actually against the rules and the protest is upheld. It's going to be upheld by the conference because NC2A Appendix E1F says judgment calls traditionally not been subject to reversal include, amongst other things, balls and strikes. So, yeah, reversing the ball strike call was a problem. Now, getting together and reversing that interference call, that's okay. Though, again, in judgment, if you call that strike three, I think that that actually was interference. But reversing it, that's understandable. But to reverse strike three to ball four goes against baseball. Oddly enough, I think that the call at the end of the day, because I thought the pitch was located out of the strike zone, from this camera angle at least, which is iffy. It should have been ball four, in my opinion, so I think that at the end of the day, the ultimate result of the play was correct had it been called in real time, but given that the umpire did call this strike three, I think you have to keep that, get the interference, or reverse it depending on your conference, but you cannot reverse the ball strike call. It's literally against the rules. Appendix E1F. That's what the protest, that's why the conference upheld the protest. There's going to be a lot to be said about the situation handling from the umpires going on here, but yeah, broadcaster, the reason you've never seen that before is because it's quite literally against the rules. I would think that's a wild pitch. Well, Sean, if you yep. watch the game of baseball long enough, you're going to see some rather interesting sights. And I think I've seen games contested under protest before, but again, I have not seen a, a strikeout change to a walk in that type of scenario. Yeah, I would like to get an official ruling. So the official ruling is quite literally that the protest was upheld afterward. Now as an umpire, the controversy happens. You hope to get out of the inning unscathed, but here, second from disaster, chain of critical events, the next event is the wild pitch, then following that, we have a sacrifice fly that scores the tying run. We're not done yet, but in terms of the chain of critical events, you see how the disaster is unfolding. Something is going to be bubbling up and boiling later on, thanks to all of this that has happened. I, I don't think anyone was tossed, but I'm not, not yet. surprised at the end of this inning if, if there's more uh, discussion, to say the least. Um, I'm going to say that there may be a person or persons on each side may not make the entire game today. Jamie Rabel steps in. Again, these players have to just maintain their focus as best possible. Easier said than not, as that's a good curveball. Think about it this way. If you're the defense, it was one nothing. You are out of the inning. Now you're back in the inning, two outs, it's a tie game, and we're not even out of the woods yet. So, yeah, this is not a good situation for anyone because someone didn't follow the rules. Good block there by Franti, the catcher. I also want to point out, anytime someone on a team says they only care about getting a call right, uh, that's not true at all. This play is a great example of it, because I think that they got the call right. That was ball four, but they didn't follow the rules to do it, and it hurt this team, so therefore, even though they got the call right, the team's not happy that they got the call right, because they didn't do it the right way. 
Rabel hits this one hard. That is deep to right field, still going back, and it is off the wall as he has at least The next critical event in our seconds from disaster, the go-ahead run has scored thanks to this double. And then we're going to have a crack in our Liberty Bell. Getting the start this afternoon. And I think one of the players just got tossed for Mercyhurst. It looks like it is the shortstop, Sebazic. Now we're going to have Joe Spano out once again. I just want to say, if you're an umpire, don't do anything that you're about to see in the next 30 seconds. You can hear right now, Roger, the umpire saying it's under protest. If it's going to change, it will be changed afterwards. Spano, Spano's brother, I believe, Charlie Spano, has been tossed. Is that correct? Did I hear Charlie is gone? Yes. But they still have to replace a fielder to the Lakers. Yeah. Right now, Spano is telling his players not to talk to the umpire. This is the opposite of the game management that you want. As we see the sarcastic applause by someone who appeared to have been ejected, coaches on the phone maybe with an assigner or somebody. Field umpire, fine. The player needed to go because of some unsporting thing. We don't need to look back. We don't need to follow it up with, oh yeah, he's got, I think everyone got the message when you did the ejection mechanic the first time. Don't follow it up by repeating it. Don't look back at the player to try to say, yeah, what? The plate umpire looks a lot more in control of the situation at this point than the field umpire does, just an observation. But overall, this is a bad look. Don't charge across the diamond toward a dugout to antagonize a team. Coaching The coach using the word antagonize, I think that's very apt. That's exactly what it looks like the base umpire is doing here. Stay in your spot. Don't go toward a dugout and then stand behind the foul line like it's the Rio Grande. The whole point of the Rio Grande is you tell the manager not to cross it. It's not for yourself because you're supposed to be in more control than that. Anywho, here's the end of the inning and more fun is about to occur. Third, Elliot has it, throws across, and what could be described as a nightmare inning comes to an end. I had already written down... Plate umpire's doing great going up the first baseline, doesn't want to do have to do anything with anyone, but then seconds from disaster, chain of critical events, the field umpire says, let's go talk to them. Why would you do that? Now, fortunately, uh, while they're on their way to do that, third base coach, I believe it is, kind of distracts them. So that's pretty good. But they're already on that side of the field. So the pitcher wants to warm up. That's the next chain of critical events issue that we have. So they have to move toward, well, where are they going? Right in front of the dugout, who is not going to be happy with them. So I assume that whenever we get the camera operator to move the camera, they're going to pan over and we are going to see someone from the dugout, at least one person, arguing with the umpires about what just happened. All because the chain of critical events was activated by the field umpire saying, let's go talk to them, while the plate umpire was more than content staying on the opposite side of the field and talking to no one. But because the field umpire said we needed to get involved, that means that there should be more yelling in about five seconds. Well, if you're Coach Maz and the Griffins right now, the best thing is just to try to uh, ignore this, right? All right, yes, they got to focus on the game. And actually, as do the Lakers at this point. So once again, the plate umpire goes straight back to work, but the field umpire takes, you have to be behind first base. That's your position. Why are you walking toward third base? That's a really weird route to take. Plate umpire said that, uh, for the coach at least, I blinked and that's why we changed the call. I missed it because I blinked. Look, you can blink, it happens, but when you call attention to it by going to a conference and, and reversing an unreversible call, it creates a lot more problems. This is over umpiring that caused a lot more than should have occurred. The umpires went back and decided not only was that batter's interference wiped away, but it was changed from strike three to ball four. Peterson aboard, Oberdorf to second. It led to a sack fly by Rousseau and an RBI double by Rabel to bring two runs home in the inning as now Aiden Layton misses badly on a couple of offerings. Yeah, Dom Sassiri now to the plane in his first at bat, taking the place of Sebastic. 
And you can hear in our crowd, Mike, each dugout trying to outdo the... So to cap off our story several innings later, this is how the game ends. And the protest, as I remind you, was upheld because the umpires didn't follow the rules. The catch is the Griffins take game one. They come from behind to do so. And Seton Hill improves to 11-2 in the PSAC. We should note, Roger, while this game is a, fi a final, it is technically under protest for Mercy. As a reminder, yes, that protest was upheld, so none of this counted anyway. Two-run game, two-run controversy. Seconds from disaster review. First, the plate umpire purportedly blinked and missed the pitch. Second, they met and the umpires reversed a non-reversible ball strike call. Third, when they got together with the head coach of the offended team, the field umpire interacted with the dugout. Umpires couldn't get out of the inning like any umpire would hope that they'd get out without being scathed. There was a wild pitch, then a sacrifice fly, then a double. The next thing that went wrong was the field umpire exaggerated the ejection by repeating the ejection mechanic, looking back at the player he had just ejected. Doesn't look good. Next up, there was more discussion between umpire and players. Coach accused the umpires of antagonizing the team, telling them to stop talking to the umpire, they'll just throw everyone out. And that created an even further charged atmosphere that exploded at the end of the inning when the plate umpire was up the first baseline, but the field umpire said, nah, let's go over and talk to them in front of their dugout for some weird reason. The pitcher wanted to warm up, so they had to even go further toward the dugout and then talk to multiple people yet again on the offended team when they really shouldn't have done any of that. Put them all together and you have the perfect disaster of what not to do in a baseball game. For what you should do, visit CloseCallSports.com, Twitter and Facebook, at CloseCallSports. We hope not to have to do any more of these types of videos, but when something really bad happens, it's important to learn from it. We'll see you on the site.